first, I want to welcome everyone to uh, beautiful Phoenix campus ballroom uh, for tonight's distinguished lecture. Before I introduce the speaker, I want to introduce the lecture series because uh, this is our Lodato C distinguished uh, lecture series that uh, is being launched today with Cecilia Sorensen. Uh, for those who are not aware of it, Lodato C was a papal encyclical uh, that was uh, um, promulgated, I guess, by the uh, Pope, and uh, it speaks to care for our common home. So there are many voices um, urging action to respond to climate change, and uh, we decided to name this series after that. Why are we doing this? I will give you a couple answers. About four years ago, a group of medical students came to the dean's office with a planetary health report card um, assessing what we were doing as a medical school in the realm of teaching and education and community engagement and facilities and waste management and supply chain and investment strategies and so forth to address climate change. And um, while many of us, I think, were aware of the importance of the issue, um, this was a bit of a wake-up call, for me at least, to realize that as a medical school, we actually have an organized res we have responsibility in this space. As a health system, we have a responsibility in this space. And it was the students who really brought this, at least to my attention, and as anyone who reads health affairs or academic medicine or JAMA or any of the leading medical journals are aware. This issue has been covered um, quite extensively in the last three years, uh, different research projects and other uh, initiatives that are underway by health systems and medical schools to address climate change. And so one of our uh, approaches to address this at the Creighton University School of Medicine is a distinguished lecture series. And for those who are not aware of it, tomorrow there's a School of Medicine leadership retreat, and we're dedicating three hours of the retreat to a discussion of strategic planning on the part of the school and our academic health system partners in this space. So that is the kind of setting for the talk here today. And I couldn't be happier uh, to have anyone else here other than Cecilia Sorensen, who is a real national leader in climate medicine. Uh, I had the opportunity to hear Cecilia speak at the uh, AAMC meeting uh, last year. Uh, was a great speaker. She's been active in this field. The, we had an interesting conversation. There are no like mid-career and late-career climate medicine faculty in medical schools, <laughs> um, but she's been active in this field for as long as anyone else and um, has held numerous uh, positions, including she's a member of the Lancet Countdown on Health and Climate Change, serves on the National Academy of Medicine Action Collaborative for Decarbonization of the U.S. Health Sector, and is co-editor of uh, the leading textbook, Climate Change and Human Health from Science to Practice. She's consulted nationally and internationally on engagement with uh, communities on how to address these issues, and I am just uh, thrilled to be able to welcome Cecilia Sorensen to Creighton. Well, thank you so much. And really, um, congratulations on all the work that's being done on this campus. Um, I've talked to a lot of different folks in different places, and I've got to say, having this as the agenda for a leadership strategic planning session is the first I've ever heard of this happening nationally. So congratulations on that. And I know you've got a lot of really dedicated students in this space. I'd have to say students really tend to be leading the charge in a lot of places. Um, so that's really great to, to know that they're here too. Well, I'm an emergency medicine physician, and someone asked me, well, how did you get into climate change? I mean, this is, you know, like, how, how, how could you, why are you thinking about this? Aren't you treating the person with a heart attack in front of you, right? But the reality is, is and what I'm going to share with you today is how I see climate change being really intrinsically linked to the healthcare we provide and the reasons why our patients are sick and why they seek our care to begin with. And so thinking about how do you get really upstream from the emergency room? Well, what are those factors? What are those things out there that are really driving illness and disease in our communities and as well as globally? And I think climate change is, is one of the biggest ones, if not now, will be in the next five to 10 years. And so my goal is to really share that perspective with you. And I welcome um, questions, comments, suggestions. Um, yeah, and even uh, if you don't agree with me, I'm happy to hear that too. Okay, all right. 
So we'll, we'll just dive right in. So, um, well, there we go. So you read the news, right? You, you pick up your phone and there's all this different types of headlines, right? These historic events happening really all over the country, all over the world. Has climate change migration already begun? And the World Health Organization calling climate change the biggest health threat currently facing humanity right? Like this is, this is huge. And I think for a, a lot of people, this sort of came a little bit out of left field. Like we all grew up kind of thinking about a polar bear and the iceberg, but you know, we kind of went from that to then saying, okay, this is the greatest global health threat facing humanity. So how did we get there? And, and where are these calls from urgency coming from? That quote from the World Health Organization was made after this report came out. So this was the 20 22 IPCC report. So this is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, a group of hundreds of scientists from almost every country that's part of the United Nations that gets together and compares their best evidence and science on what is happening with climate change and what are we going to do about it? And this was the report where they really focused in on human health and health impacts and basically came out and said, this is a code red for humanity. Right. And we know what that means. And I think that that language is really important. Right. That's talking to us. That's talking to health professionals. This is a code red. Right. So as I mentioned, right, we, we used to think sort of climate change, you've got the polar bear and the iceberg. Super sad. Right. But more and more, we're shifting this lens. It, it is the polar bear and the iceberg still, but it's also our kids with asthma. We know that air pollution is a cause of childhood onset of asthma, a cause. It takes a lot to say that in medicine. We know that climate change is worsening pregnancy and delivery outcomes around the world, right? In this community as well. So I wanna share with you some high level findings from this report. So this was like a 3000 page report. So I'm not expecting anybody to read it. I, I actually didn't read it. I read the high level summaries, but these are the things that really stuck out to me, right? So one of the things that this found was that climate sensitive diseases are estimated to comprise 70% of global deaths. So what does that mean? So these health outcomes listed on this table, all of them together account for 70% of global mortality. And all of them are impacted by climate change. Climate change is affecting their frequency, their prevalence, their intensity, and their distribution. And so if we study, or if we treat any of the diseases on this list, then we need to understand how climate change is impacting them because otherwise, how are we gonna take the best care possible of our patients, right? They also looked at observed impacts of climate change on human systems. And I think one of the biggest take homes from this report is that the impacts are already happening. This isn't something in the future, right? So we're looking here at different global regions. We're looking at impacts on water scarcity and food production, impacts on health and well being, and impacts on our cities, settlements, and infrastructure. And so the darker the circle is, the more evidence or certainty we have. Just because there's a, a blank circle, it doesn't mean there's no impacts happening. It means we just don't have the data or we don't have the evidence to really understand it. Negative obviously means that it's a negative impact on that area, right? So we're seeing impacts. They're happening all over the world. They're happening related to health, but also things that support good health, right? Like agriculture, um, like water security. Second big finding from the IPCC is that climate change is worsening health inequities, right? We know everyone is impacted in some way, but climate change is gonna disproportionately impact groups and people who are economically or socially marginalized. So research shows that nearly two thirds of morbidity costs are currently being shouldered by our Medicare and Medicaid patients. And the World Bank Group estimates that by 2030, an additional 130 million new people will be pushed into extreme poverty mostly due to the health impacts of climate change. And so over the past you know, 10 to 20 years, we've actually made really good progress towards achieving sustainable development goals. And now what this is saying is that we are facing massive headwinds, right? We can't take these gains for granted because there's a lot of new things that are emerging and that are gonna to continue to emerge. But I think this is our silver lining. I think this is our chance. So the IPCC concludes with very high certainty that the severity of climate related health risks is highly dependent on how well health systems can protect people. So these health impacts that we're gonna talk about, these are not inevitabilities. When we build and design strong health systems, we know that with timely, proactive and effective adaptation, that many risks for human health and well-being could be reduced and some potentially avoided. And so what this says to me is that, you know, we are, we're on the front lines and we are also the last line in some ways of defense. And so we have to ready ourselves. We have to understand what these impacts are and what we're gonna do about it. 
But we're stuck in this paradox, right? So if the global healthcare sector were a country, you took all the health facilities all over the globe and you put them together, they would actually be the fifth largest emitter of greenhouse gases on the planet. So there's like the US, China, you know, India, and then there's like hospitals, right? And, you know, we have this 24 seven mission. Um, but the reality is, is that we can do what we're doing right now with a lot less resources and there's ways to do it. And we'll talk about that as well. So people like me who study climate medicine, we think about connecting climate change to health. And here's a really complicated diagram thinking about how we get there. I'm going to simplify it a little bit for the sake of this talk and share this figure from the Lancet Countdown, which is a little bit of a roadmap. So we know that there's what we call increased anthropogenic greenhouse gases. Those are fossil fuels. Those are things that we have put into the atmosphere because we burn fossil carbon. And because of that, the climate gets disturbed. The climate system changes. We have the greenhouse gas effect. And because of that, we see increased temperatures, more extreme weather, rising sea levels, extremes of precipitation. And because of those, we have exposure pathways, right? These are the things most proximal to health. That includes heat waves, air pollution, water contamination, changes in vector ecology, impacts on food supply and quality. And then that, of course, inherently impacts health outcomes, right? So I want to start with uh, with a case from, from my practice in the emergency department. So case one, this is a 76-year-old male. He's got a history of a cardiac arrhythmia, hypertension. He takes multiple unknown medications, of course, um, and he speaks Spanish only. So he came into my emergency room with a complaint that he was lightheaded and that he passed out. Um, his family brought him in. And by the time I saw him, he was awake and alert. Um, his heart rate was 110. His blood pressure was 178 over 80. And his temperature was 100.1. Second case, this is a 36-year-old male, previously healthy. His chief complaint was confusion. He had been driving all day in an agricultural setting in an enclosed tractor, and he was found confused at the work site. He arrived to the emergency department via ambulance. When I saw him, he was ill appearing. He was arousable to voice. He had very dry skin. His heart rate was 130. His blood pressure was 105 over 80, and his core temperature was 103.3. Okay. So just two examples. So th these cases demonstrate heat exhaustion and heat stroke. Two diseases or conditions on the spectrum of heat-related illness that we're seeing a ton more of, right? And when we look at sort of why people get sick because of heat, it's multifactorial. If we think about the first case, right? Well, they were higher than average temperatures in the area, but it wasn't a heat wave. He was an elderly male. He was on multiple medications. He spoke Spanish. Maybe he didn't really understand that if there were any warnings in place. He also didn't think he was vulnerable, right? When I sort of told him, you know, I think this is heat exhaustion, he said, no, no, no. He's like, I'm from El Salvador. I know heat, you know, but, but you don't know the heat we're seeing today. We're seeing heat that we've never seen before, right? And he had no air conditioning in his home. Pre-hospital, his community wasn't really aware of heat being an issue. His family didn't think of this. They thought it was probably, you know, he had an arrhythmia. When we got to the facility, you know, we had no chilled fluids in our emergency room. We had no social worker on duty who could help doing home assessments. So we could send this guy back to a safe place. And of course, because of our complex electronic health record system, I had no ability to communicate with his PCP to talk about the multiple diuretics and beta blockers he was on, right? That are putting him at risk of getting heat-related illness in a hot summer, right? Case two, again, this was not a heat wave. This was just a higher than average day. We have no federal heat standard, right? So there's no uh, obligation for employers to stop their laborers from working at any temperature. So this is a big federal problem. So he was working in, in dangerous heat. And he also, 36 years old, didn't suspect he was vulnerable. Pre-hospital, our paramedics didn't take a core temperature in the field, unfortunately. So cooling was not started. His coworkers didn't know what was going on. They're like, I don't know, why is he confused? This is this is weird. Um, basically, when he got to the facility, um, we, you know, the gold standard of treatment for heat stroke is cold water immersion. I don't know if you've been to an ER lately, but we don't have bathtubs. We don't, right? So we had to send the janitor across the street to the gas station because we exhausted our ice machine. I mean, this is this is happening, right? Um, so if we kind of extrapolate that out, um, I was going to give an example from Phoenix, but I gave, I'm going to give this example from the Pacific Northwest because this is an area of the world that never saw this coming, right? So 2021, 
they had near surface air temperature anomalies up to 20 degrees Celsius greater than what they were used to experiencing. They had relatively short advance notice. And this was the middle of COVID, right? They had acute on chronic capacity constraints. So there was a hundred fold increase in heat related ED visits. Like we can barely manage one heat stroke patient. And now we've got a hundred fold increase, right? And then the mortality actually soared above that of COVID during this week of the heat wave. And it was found that community deaths were higher in neighborhoods with material and so social deprivation, lower levels of green space. We knew that men we found that mental illness and substance use were significant risk factors, and the highest risk was among elderly, and particularly in this community, it was among women. So these, these events are happening and, and they're becoming more frequent. And what happened in the Pacific Northwest. Not surprisingly, 911 call centers were completely overwhelmed. There were surges in hospitals. Several facilities lost power because there was a brownout. There were no regional disaster plans for heat waves. And so what they did was they're like, well, from their models, they thought the most likely disaster to hit the region was going to be an earthquake. Well, it did all the right things. They activated, you know, hit the earthquake button, get out the binder, right? It gets the right people on the phone, but it doesn't deal with all these facility issues and all these heat-related illness treatment issues that come up. Um, again, because most parts of the world, we are using retrospective analysis to predict the future. But the reality is the future is going to be completely different from the past. So we need to sort of fix that piece of our disaster planning. So they had this never again moment. They said, OK, well, now we have a heat action plan. Now we have all these things happening, right? And so, so now this whole region is sort of mobilized to this point. But what we're trying to avoid is, is every city having to go through this experience where you've got excess mortality in the thousands um, and hospitals really coming up against the edge with, with a lot of detrimental impacts to staff, mental health wise, as well as the communities around them who trust them, right, to be ready for these types of events. So, oh, wait, okay. So what we know is that mean surface temperatures have shifted, right? On average, about 1.2 degrees, which doesn't sound like a lot. Although this year we might've peaked past 1.5. But the reality with climate change is it's not just the average temperatures that matter. It's the fact that this curve is shifting, but it's also flattening, meaning the tails are getting longer. So we're getting these extremes, extreme hot, but also extreme cold, like snowstorms and ice storms in Texas, right, which also cause a lot of impacts on healthcare systems and facilities. And so, of course, we think about heat illness, we think about heat stroke, all the heat related conditions. But the reality is, is that heat exacerbates many other types of illnesses. It makes people more likely to have heart attacks, more likely to have strokes, COPD and asthma exacerbations. We see, of course, exacerbations of diseases related to kidney and liver health, like dehydration, acute renal failure. We see more cases of gastroenteritis. We see more infectious outbreaks. And then we see a lot of impacts on pregnant women, right? We see preterm deliveries. We see more stillbirths, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we can't just focus on those heat-related illnesses. We have to realize that many different types of patients are vulnerable. And so when you look at data of who comes in during, during hot times, well, we see everybody coming in, right? It's, 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 a, it's a kind of all hands on deck situation. And the interesting thing is, is that they don't just come in during heat waves because every individual has a different threshold at which they're gonna start getting sick, right? So if you're you know, 89 years old and you've got a heart condition and you're on all these medications, you're on some sedatives, some antidepressants, man, if it's like 10 degrees above normal for you, you're probably gonna have some problems, right? Versus a young, healthy person who has access to air conditioning, right? So everybody has a different threshold at which they get sick. We actually see the most mortality on the shoulders of heat waves because maybe there's a lot of reasons why, but potentially because during heat waves, we're actually doing the public health warnings, but then right before them, if we're not at the threshold, we're not doing the warnings. Who knows? We need to understand more. The bottom line is, the present heat that we're experiencing is not like the heat we experienced in the past. So just as some examples to put in perspective, in a, an extreme heat wave with a 10 year return period in this historic times now occurs three times as often. And an extreme heat event with a 50 year return period now occurs five times as often. So these extreme anomalous heat waves are just gonna keep happening more and more and more, right? It's anticipated that nearly 4 billion people will soon be exposed to life-threatening wet bulb globe temperatures. Wet bulb globe is a way we sort of factor in humidity to heat. And so we're seeing massive exposures to heat really all over the world. And so this is where we're looking at the uh, percentage change in absolute number of heat wave deaths in adults older than 65. Um, 
this is using imperfect data, right? But we're seeing impacts all over the world, a lot in China, also a lot in the US though, um, and in many places. So quick summary here, you know, a lot of impacts on health from heat, but then a lot of healthcare system impacts related to it, right? Facility challenges, difficulties maintaining cold chain when it comes to supply, risk of power outages, um, increased healthcare utilization, surges in, in needs for acute care, and so on and so forth. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about, about flooding, right? Again, these headlines pop up again and again. Vermont, right? Burlington, Vermont, I don't know if you caught that. Like the, the, they flooded to the point where, I mean, the capital city of Vermont was like literally under several feet of water. California and these atmospheric rivers coming in, these tsunami-like waves hitting the coast, right? Like these events are happening more and more. And so the issue is water, water, and, and what comes after that, right? So this is... Um, data that comes out of NOAA every year. So our National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And what they do is they look at what they call billion dollar weather and climate related disasters. So to get on this map, the disaster has to have caused a billion dollars or more in infrastructure damage, not even looking at health impacts, just infrastructure damage. And so in 2023, there were 28 separate events. And so at some point, right, like FEMA can't actually bail, continue to bail out, right? Um, and we're seeing that, that, that we're having less and less of a mobilization. It used to be that, you know, a mayor could declare um, a federal, emer an emergency, right? And then you'd get sort of federal support. But when this is happening 28 times a year, it's kind of hard to, to get the, the support that you need, right? This is looking uh, at, uh, at disasters over the past 40 years. And what we're seeing is, of course, they're increasing, right? We're seeing um, the green is severe storms, so those hurricanes, those floods. Um, we're seeing increase in droughts, increase in wildfires, right? Tropical cyclones. These are all going up, and they're costing billions and billions of dollars. And that's the reality. And those those expenses get spread across across everybody, essentially. Um, this is some data um, from PNAS, which is looking at the at what hurricanes are doing in different ocean basins. And basically we see that the proportion of hurricanes that are becoming major hurricanes is increasing around the world. Well, why is that? Um, well, basically what you have is you have warmer air, warmer sea surface temperature, you have sea level rise, and there's just this increased um, energy availability in these storms. So they get higher wind speeds, they intensify more rapidly, and you end up getting more destructive storms. We're also looking at this issue related to extreme precipitation. And that means like it's not just raining cats and dogs, like it's raining, you know, a foot of rain over two days, right? And and we're not equipped to deal with that. In the US, no, but even globally thinking about that. And so this, this whole uh, way that we sort of look at flood mapping is really coming under scrutiny. So if you live in an area that has a one in 100 year risk of a flood, well, now that one in 100 year risk is actually gonna be once every eight years. So completely rewarping, you know, how we're looking at risk around around the country, and um, you know, how does that affect our hospitals and health systems? Well, we know that there's the direct health toll related to these extreme weather events, right? Um, trauma and drownings, electrocutions, but then there's sort of what comes after, right? Well, what comes after is often the facilities get damaged, right? Facilities flood, and then people can't get care. Or if you look at what happened in Puerto Rico with Hurricane Maria, where many different pharmaceuticals and many different devices which we use are manufactured, well, now we can't get the things that we need to give the drugs that we usually give because of our complex supply chains. And so really all our sort of ways that we provide care are potentially coming under threat because of these issues. So again, kind of thinking about the scope of hurricanes, the scope of flooding, you know, we have health impacts and then we have healthcare system impacts. I was working in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria, and we were doing a door-to-door -door survey to try to understand what the mortality was. And what we found is, first of all, we found that the first quote was that 76 people had died. And then our study came and said, actually, it was probably more like 6,000 people died. And not just from the direct impact of the hurricane, but in the month to months that followed because of a loss of access to health care and because the roads were destroyed. And the single leading cause of death following Hurricane Maria was sepsis. Sepsis, we know, is like one of the most time-sensitive conditions. And so to me, that, that says is people, people aren't getting timely care because their hospitals and health systems have shut down or they can't get to them, right? Um, so we've got to be thinking about this, right? And the communities that really count on us to provide care. 
This is looking, um, I think this interesting data, looking at FEMA data after Hurricane Katrina, right? We know the hurricane impacted New Orleans, but look where everybody went, like all over. The people ended up in Alaska, right? Um, they went family, friends, wherever they could go. But the reality is, is that probably all of us have taken care of somebody who's been a, a, a victim or been forced to migrate or forced to move because of some type of extreme event. On a global level, this is data from 2020. There was 40 million new displacements in, in 2020. About 10 million of those were due to conflict and violence, 30 million due to disasters. And from just what you've learned here, this graph is calling them weather related. These are floods, extreme temperatures, landslides, wildfires, and droughts, right? These are climate-driven disasters, and they're driving massively the forced migration issues that we're seeing globally around the world. We can't talk about climate change without talking about air pollution. The two are really intri intrinsically linked, and air pollution is a big deal. It's actually now the fourth leading cause of death worldwide, and air pollution comes from burning fossil fuels, right? But then we're stuck in this catch-22 because we burn fossil fuels, that's changing the climate, and now we have more wildfires, right? Because we have more drought, more extreme temperatures. So this was an attribution analysis that looked at what per what percentage of wildfires that have burned, were burned, would have burned without climate change versus those that have burned. And roughly 50% of the current wildfires we can attribute to being driven by climate change, right? So we've, we're stuck, unfortunately, in this really bad positive feedback cycle with climate change, where we've got environmental change, um, which is driving wildfire issues. So this is looking sort of at future mapping, um, showing the projected number of days of very large um, wildfires, or sorry, weeks, weeks in which conditions are favorable to the occurrence of large wildfires. And so what's interesting about this map is that in a lot of parts of the world where we, sorry, parts of the country where we've seen actually air quality improve because of better vehicular emission standards, better industrial standards. Well, now we're dealing with particulate matter from wildfire smoke. And a recent study actually suggests that wildfire particulate might be something like 14 times more harmful than simple tailpipe emissions, um, be just because of the nature of what's actually in the smoke. Um, if you think about it, those pictures of Paradise, California, right? You see like entire yards burning, people's garages where they're storing all these weird old chemicals, like those outside plastic swimming pools are burning. I mean, this stuff is getting volatilized and then it's traveling thousands of kilometers downwind, right? And people are breathing it in, right? So we've got to be thinking about this stuff. We know air pollution um, has a lot of health effects, right? It's a leading, fourth leading cause of, of premature mortality um, and so on and so forth. And we know there's some populations who are very vulnerable to it, but there's things we can do, right? And just kind of a look in here at air pollution, we don't need to go into that. Um, we're, we're getting more information to try to, to understand sort of what the impacts are of air pollution, but also as that relates to heat, because they're kind of compounding exposures. They affect different physiologic pathways, but they're synergistic in terms of their effects. And so this is a study looking at preterm births, low birth weight, and stillbirths in the US, and looking at how air pollution and heat are really playing into that. And of course, we we see impacts. So I used to live in Colorado, and I was the other day someone said, you know, something, something about smoke season. I was like, smoke season, what is that? Well, that happens somewhere between like summer and fall where we basically spend six to eight weeks all breathing horrible smoke. That's coming from Canada, that's coming from Idaho, wherever it is, it's smoke season. This is, this is new, okay? So what are the health impacts of recurrent exposure to wildfire smoke? Well, the reality is like, we have no idea. And this was one study that was looking actually 10 years after some really large wildfires affected Indonesia. And 10 years later, the people surveyed had lower lung capacity. Um, they did spirometry, lower self-reported general health, and lower self-reported physical functioning. That was one wildfire exposure. I mean, it was intense, but we, we, there's a lot of unanswered research questions, a lot of things that we still need to understand about the impacts of these exposures on our health. Um, okay. I know we have some microbiologists in the room, so I'm going to talk a little bit about infectious diseases. Um, you know, looking here at, at, at several different vectors, which transmit a lot of global disease. So the Culex mosquito transmits West Nile virus, Aedes, um, Aedes allopictus, um, and Aedes aegyptii transmits dengue, chikungunya, and then Anopheles mosquitoes, which transmit malaria, right? 
And so the habitat where these vectors live is changing because of climate change, right? It's hotter, there's more precipitation, there's more flooding, there's more standing water. And actually it's really interesting. So if you look at where these diseases are occurring, well, they're changing because the climate's changing and therefore where the vectors live is changing. So for example, um, the 80s mosquito, which carries dengue, it likes it really, really hot, right? Whereas malaria and the Anopheles mosquito, it doesn't like it quite as hot, right? So I've done some work in West Africa and you know, pretty much you treat empirically for malaria because it's malaria until proven otherwise, but that's changing because the climate's changing. And so it's probably actually not malaria. And there was a study published a few years ago looking at febrile illnesses in a Kenyan hospital. And they actually were able to sort of do all the complex PCR and virology and bacterial stuff. And you know, 60% of them were empirically diagnosed and treated with malaria and turned out only about 10% of them had malaria. And the other 90%, well, it was dengue. It was all these other different um, climate sensitive diseases, right? That local clinicians have not quite caught up in terms of realizing what is happening in the backyard because it's changing under our feet, right? I always think of sort of the example of, um, of Lyme disease, right? And so I grew up in Connecticut, right? That's Lyme, Connecticut. And it's, it's, Lyme disease is kind of a thing of the Northeast, right? But if you look at these maps of where Lyme disease was in 1996 and where we're seeing Lyme disease now, if you were trained in medicine you know, back in 1996, and now you're, you know, a doctor sitting out there in, I don't know, um, maybe Ohio. Well, now there's Lyme, but someone just comes in with a vague rash and they feel fatigued and they don't feel good. And their heart's doing kind of a weird thing, but you're like, I don't know, maybe it's rheumatic, rheumatic fever, you know, right? Like you're not thinking Lyme because, but the point is, is that things are shifting under our feet. And this is data from the CDC looking at tick-borne diseases and how we're seeing them going up over time. Um, so it's not just Lyme, it's also anaplasmosis or lichiosis, babesiosis, all these other um, tick transmitted infections. It's not just climate change, right? It's also land use patterns. It's how we interact with the environment. It's where we build our homes and our cities. Um, but all of that really contributes to us having more interface with wildlife and with ticks potentially. So those are just kind of three examples of how, how we think about climate and health, and how we kind of trace mechanisms and how we try to understand how the impacts are going to be, what they look like, who's vulnerable, and what can we do about it. There's a couple of long-term changes that I didn't talk about. Sea level rise, not an issue in Phoenix, um, which is good here, but lots of parts of the world have a big issue with sea level rise. Drought, big issue here. You know, Are we in a drought or are we just moving into a period of increased aridification of this entire area of the West, right? Um, and what happens with that? Well, we have crop failure, food insecurity, economic impacts, forced migration, right? Thinking about that. And then of course, thinking about the mental health impacts of all of this on us as health professionals, kind of on the front lines of this, but also communities who are coping with all these different impacts that they're experiencing. So I wanna talk a little bit about sort of our approach and what, 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 what do we do about this information, right? So the way we kind of think about it is, is in two buckets. So one is adaptation and the other is mitigation. And adaptation is basically saying, yep, this is happening. We need to adapt. We need to change what we're doing to be more in line with the current realities, right? We know that heat waves are happening five times more likely. Well, we better start moving that thing up on the priority list of our planning, right? So there's adaptation and then there's mitigation where we say, well, we really need to stop producing so much greenhouse gases, right? Um, and the reality is we have to do both because climate change isn't an all or nothing situation, right? Like every every you know tenth of a degree matters, right? So we, we have to do both. And really those interventions that achieve both are the ones where we wanna really be thinking about, about investing, right? So what so what what is what does the health professional have to do with this right like how do we how do we think about this and how do we sort of bring it home to our practice well it's interesting because us in the health professions you know we we wear a lot of different hats right um, we're private citizens uh, we're institutional leaders some of us in this room we're trusted community voices right like your neighbor your people in your community they kind of know that you're in the health profession and they probably ask you things that you wish they wouldn't ask you about their health right um and then and then maybe you're a researcher right um and maybe you're a clinician right but but in each of these each of these roles like there's a way that you can sort of think about 
what what does climate do and and how can I address this and sort of where I am, right? So I kind of try to think about, you know, what are the prescriptions that I would write? If I like this magic prescription pad of what we need hospitals, health systems, and health professionals to do. So the first thing I, I, I would write a prescription for is that we need to adapt clinical care and service delivery planning for our current climate realities. So kind of going back to that case example of the Pacific Northwest, right? Like they thought the most likely thing that was going to happen was going to be an earthquake. But if they know if they looked at climate models and incorporated that into their planning, they might have thought differently, right? We need to be doing this everywhere we are. And it's it's not happening at a pace that we need to. We're seeing a lot of cities that are doing this, but we're not seeing hospitals and health systems incorporating this into their disaster planning. So we need to be thinking about that. So that involves undertaking healthcare climate vulnerability assessments. What is this health system vulnerable to? And have we thought about that and what that would do to our multiple ways which we provide care? We also have an urgent need right now to really build the evidence base to understand the interactions between climate change and human health. This is a new science. There's a lot of unanswered questions. We're seeing an explosion in research right now, but there's still a lot of unanswered questions. For example, we see more preterm births and more stillbirths when it's really hot out. Why? We don't know. What can we do to prevent it? We don't know. Uh, what level of, you know, what trimester of exposure is, is most relevant? We don't know, right? There's a lot of really important basic questions that we need to answer, right? Um, so if you do research and you look at health outcomes, what's the role of climate in, in what it is that you study, right? And then we need to think about how we create, update, and adjust our health guidance and treatment plans um, to, to treat for anticipated health burdens from climate change, right? You know, um, thinking about sort of what's been happening in terms of, you know, what are risk factors for cardiovascular disease? We think about whether well, there's obesity, there's smoking, there's hypertension, there's hyperlipidemia, but air pollution is actually a major risk factor. And we, don't, we never talk about it. We never talk about it with our patients. We don't advise people about it. We don't give them opportunities for things they can do to change it, right? Um, so we've got to be thinking about how we incorporate these things into our into our diagnosis and planning. It could also be involved screening for um, screening for for issues related to mental health, right? Um, we know that after extreme weather events, that there's the rates of domestic violence go way up. The risks of alcoholism and drug abuse go way up. You know, maybe we need to have protocols in our systems that increase screening, that increase staffing for these types of things because we know the science tells us it's going to happen. So I think there's there's a lot that we can do to really adapt how we currently practice medicine to be more in line with what the evidence is telling us and where the future is going. The next thing I'd sort of write a prescription for is us as, as health professionals training for recognizing and managing climate-related diseases and that system-wide preparedness. So this is a, this is a sim center um, where these students are going through uh, a heat stroke case, right? They're understanding like, okay, this is a time sensitive thing. We've got 30 minutes to lower a core temperature. What does that take? What do we need to do? Uh, we published recently this emergency management of heat stroke in the Western Journal of Emergency Medicine. Nobody reads that journal. That's fine. Um, you're right. But like, we couldn't get anybody else to publish it, you know? So like, there it is. But this is an evidence-based treatment protocol, which which didn't exist before it, right? Um, but now we have it tacked up in a few hospitals, you know. But but these are the kinds of things, right? That we 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 need to be thinking about that, that we can be doing that will improve care, right? And then we need to be thinking about educating ourselves, our patients, and our communities. And I know a lot of that's already underway here, which is incredible. Um, so just some examples, you know, thinking about climate change and pregnancy, um, we can counsel our patients, we can tell them what we know, we can give them advice about how to avoid heat, what to do if it's extremely hot out, right? We can think about how we schedule clinic appointments not in the heat of the day, right? When we know that our vulnerable patients are taking buses to get to our clinics, right? We don't want them out in the heat, right? How can we change what we do? Um, so there's lots of different ways to do this. Um, there's some great resources um, that are being developed through a group called AmeriCares, um, which are like handouts for patients, discharge instructions, clinic posters, like all these things that we can do to sort of educate our patients about, about this type of work and educate our communities. Um, which brings me to kind of the work that we're doing. So I direct something called the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education. So this was formed in 2017. Uh, it was formed at the Paris Climate Accords, right? The big conference where everybody kind of agreed, okay, we're going to do something. Like, we're going to make commitments. 
Um, and it was it was a meeting of about 60 deans of, of health professional schools and they got together. And at this point, no one was really talking about climate change and health, right? This was before the big IPCC report. And they decided that they would form a consortium, that they would pledge to train their students in climate health, nurses, doctors, um, you know, PhD researchers, master's students in public health, um, all types of health professionals about the health impacts. And so over the past, oh, I guess it's been seven years, it's grown from a consortium of 60 schools to now over 350. And these are deans who, who take a pledge and then we work really hard to make it easy for the schools to be able to do this work, right? And so we have a lot of different activities, um, but we're roughly reaching an estimated 200,000 students annually, which is which is really exciting. And we have tons of uh, free CME-based opportunities to train faculty, because that's actually one of the weakest um, links is getting faculty who are able and confident to treat to teach this stuff. Um, and so this is this is the work that we do. This was a study that came out of the AAMC, which is I think is really interesting. So um, Tom alluded to the fact that this is a this is a pretty newly emerging concern and interest, especially among our students. But this study from AAMC showed that over the past three years, the percentage of medical schools with required curriculum on climate and health has doubled. And now roughly half of all American medical schools are teaching something about climate change and health, which is, which is, I mean, this is literally over the past three years. So if you blinked, it's okay. Like, yeah, you could have just missed this whole thing, but this is happening. And this is a movement that what, from what I've seen is being driven by students. Like they, they see these impacts and they want us to do something about it. Right. And so there's a lot of different ways that I think academic medical centers can respond we're seeing, you know, kind of the early, the early adoption here, like almost like the invention of the wheel, like, okay, every, every university is doing something different, uh, which is really exciting. Um, but I think what we need to move to next is really thinking about how do we harmonize that? How do we create standards? How do we make sure we're teaching the right stuff? What are those competencies that we really want our, our students to understand and to know? And so that's a lot of the work that we do. The consortium is to really articulate those. So we have health professionals who know how to practice in the current climate and in the climate that's gonna be here in 50 years, right? Okay, um, next prescription, thinking about advocating and leading healthcare decarbonization efforts at departmental, institutional, and community levels, right? As people affiliated with the health sector, I think our ability to lead might be more than the average person potentially, right? Like when, I think when you when you work in health, you you have you have this sort of inherent trust and I think we have opportunities here. So if the world health sector, we know the global health sector, we're a sec global health care sector, we're a country, huge emissions, right? Um, but really studies have shown that you can take a hospital that's providing you know, tertiary level care and compare it to another hospital that's providing tertiary level care and look at the amount of energy consumed per square foot of hospital space. And there can be a difference of like 10 times the amount of energy used. That's huge. And so what are those hospitals doing that aren't using a lot of energy? And what are those doing that are using a ton? And how can we learn, right? Because the hospital that's not using a lot of energy, they're also saving a lot of money, potentially. Maybe they spent all that money to build a building that is LEED certified, but they're going to make that money back, right? But the point is, is that we have choices. This is not like we're stuck. There's nothing we can do. You know, we need this to provide care. There's, there's definitely opportunities. So if you've heard about this, the Healthcare Climate Pledge, this is um, uh, it's a pledge going on around the country, which is being led by HHS. There's an office in HHS called the Office of Climate and Health Equity. And more than this was this is slightly old. There's probably more than that. But last time I checked, there's more than 70 healthcare institutions representing the interests of over 14,000 hospitals um, who have basically signed this pledge. And when you sign the pledge, you're pledging to decarbonize your hospital to reach net zero by 2050. And so tons of hospitals and health systems have signed on to this, but also lots of other medical device companies have signed on to it. Pharmaceutical companies, right? Um, AstraZeneca and Stryker and, you know, um, Philips and all these different groups are really trying to get on board and do this in a collaborative fashion. So this is exciting. And I think this is sort of the, the early stages of what's going to happen. Um, but there's a lot of, a lot of support behind this, um, at least for now. So that's great. This is just a little bit of a, a, a demonstration, you know, can sustainable hospitals bend 
the healthcare cost curve, right? We're just seeing that the cost of healthcare just keeps going up and up and up. Well, you know, what this data shows is that if all U.S. hospitals adopted best practices in terms of, you know, what they say are simple things like energy use, waste segregation, looking at single-use device reprocessing, OR kit reformulation. So these four things that hospitals can do, um, that they would basically save $5 billion in five years, $15 billion in 10 years. And so some of this stuff really saves money. Um, some of it costs money up front, and then you get paid back 20 years later. But the reality is, is that using less actually costs less. And that's a good thing, right? The, the, the economic numbers are generally in our favor, although it takes some strategic planning. Okay, well, that's all I have for you today. Um, I hope I ended on, a, on an upbeat note. Um, I always try to balance it like, you know, 70, no, you should be 70% positive, 30% negative. I think I got those reversed, but um, I did want to share with you kind of all, all I had here and I welcome any questions or, or comments. That's my email. And I'm supposed to put this slide up um, to make sure you have information about CME. So thank you. We're gonna go ahead and take some questions and I will run the microphone around for anybody that has questions here. But those of you that are on Zoom, if you wanna unmute yourself, if you want to um, put anything in the chat, we do have one question in the chat already, Cecilia, and they are asking, do you know of other climate pledges besides that for healthcare? So like for universities, schools, other businesses? That's a great question. Um, I'm sure there are. Um, that's the one that I know that's kind of most people who I know in healthcare who care about this are, are galvanizing around this one um, to try to get, get some strength behind it. Um, I suspect there is some stuff going on for other industries as well, though. I don't know, unfortunately. Thank sorry. you. I use the mic so Zoom can hear us. Are there efforts to get sustainability and planetary health questions on like USMLE step one? So students are very interested in learning it. Yeah, that's interesting. And so um, at the consortium, we got together a group of our medical working group and we said, we need to do this, right? And then, so how, how do you change the board? Well, it's, it's really difficult. Um, to get questions on there if you want to. And it turns out the only way to do it is to actually become a test question writer. And so how do you become a test question writer? Well, that's also an esoteric process of nomination. And anyway, somehow we got everybody to decide that I should be the person who gets to write the question. So anyway, we went this whole process and now I'm writing questions for the NBME. Um, and there's questions on there now. So yeah, no, and I think there's, we're seeing this happen at a lot of different sort of specialty and subspecialty levels as well. Um, there's now continuing, continuous of certification modules on climate and health for pediatrics and OB. Um, and I think we're gonna be seeing more and more of this kind of spreading out. Um, but yeah, I think there's gonna be some stuff on the boards in at least the next year or two. Hi, that was a tr absolutely terrific talk. I'm, I'm Maureen Tierney. I'm the chair of the Department of Clinical Research and Public Health. Awesome. And before I had this job, I actually worked at DHHS for Nebraska. Oh, wow. and saw what the lack of good emergency preparedness can actually mean. Our state was not prepared for COVID in any way, shape, or form, primarily because of a, a, a lack of that office or that group actually really doing their jobs, hmm. to be frank. Um, yeah. So it's one of those areas, and there's a group can be led by Tom and Scott that are going to talk about governmental, at Creighton, you know, about mm -hmm. governmental interactions. Mm -hmm. And because having experts really working together and mm -hmm. sort of kind of forcing the governmental perspective that we be ready for these sort of climate issues. But the people who are going to coordinate that emergency response, it's going to be, you know, a lot of those resources are going to have to come governmentally, yeah. not from, from healthcare. So any advice on that? Yeah, no, th those are really great points. And, and two things kind of stick out to me. One is that I think government offices rely on technical scholars from academics to really help them along the way. I mean, I've given talks for like 
different HHS sectors, you know, because they need an expert to talk about, you know, heat and elderly patients. Like I'm not a geriatrician, doesn't matter. Like we need somebody to talk about them, right? So I think in that way, we can form alliances with local and, you know, regional governmental offices and, and lend our expertise. I think it's it's really appreciated because generally they're under-resourced. They don't have the in-house expertise to do this. So I think that's one part. I think the other part is, yes, to your point, like a lot of the investment in this needs to come from the federal level. But oftentimes, you know, at least my experience is, you know, when we're thinking about particularly emergency preparedness, often hospitals and health systems have a seat at the table. Whether or not they occupy that seat is different, um, but generally, you know, they have to be engaged in some level with the regional disaster response. Health, the healthcare that. coalitions and divisions, right. yeah. Right, and so so I think in that role, we have an ability to to influence an agenda in some ways. But agreed. I mean, government hopefully is going to invest in this and needs to invest in this. But, you know, right now, for example, we're, we're trying to fund a program to basically teach hospitals and sorry, teach cities and states how to do vulnerability and adaptation assessments, because we've identified that they actually don't know how to do that. Right. So there's a lot of support and there's a lot of capacity building that needs to happen at all levels, but definitely within government as well. So. Um, yeah, I think the more that academic medical centers can form those partnerships, um, they'll get there faster is my sense. Um, again, thanks Thanks for the talk. And, and just on that issue that you talked about now, support. Yeah. So one of the things that COVID made clear is that not everybody's on the same page. Yeah. And so what's your experience in dealing with those people who mm -hmm. don't see the urgency yeah. that we see for this? And the idea of getting, we know we need to have yeah. a much greater, you know, circle of support for this. So yeah. how do you reach out to those people? Yeah, that's a really, really great question. Um, and I, I think that, you know, we saw, we saw this happen, you know, during the Trump presidency in terms of how do you, how do you talk about climate change without talking about climate change? Um, and, you know, well, you talk about extreme heat, like nobody, like we, we know it's getting hotter. We know it's probably going to get more hot. Like, can you talk about these issues without bringing in the words climate change? Some people would say we shouldn't be doing that. We just need to like really stick to our guns on this. But no, the reality is that sometimes you just have to talk about the exposure. It's extreme heat. It's prolonged drought. It's severe flooding. And I think if we sort of stay away from from like words like climate change, that sometimes we're able to really build the bridges. I think the other piece is also when you talk about health, because everybody cares about health, like their health, the health of their grandparents, health of their kids, right? We all have this experience of health. And so I, the idea is that, you know, if you can pair sort of health with these exposures that you can sort of hopefully engender enough commonality that you're able to, to think like, okay, we should do something about this. But I, I yeah, I, I say it's, it's avoiding the word climate. I mean, avoiding the word climate change or global warming. Like we're just talking about extreme heat and drought and what we're going to do about it, you know? Yeah, I uh, I agree with you, Cecilia, and I think the greatest investment in renewable energies that's been made in this country was a bill passed by Congress called the Inflation Reduction mm -hmm. Act. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. so one of the brilliant maneuvers of uh, the current administration was to bury clean energy investment in a bill called an Inflation Reduction Act, and there was a something I read in the paper recently that the interesting thing is it's red states that have um, capitalized on access to that capital more than blue states. And Texas, for example, is going to be what more than 50% yeah. clean energy sometime in the very yeah. near future, for example. But I actually had a question I wanted to ask you. So um, when about a year ago, when I spoke with uh, one of the national executives at Common Spirit about our med school's interest in this area, um, I asked her, you know, what, from your perspective as an executive in a health in a very large health system, a $30 billion a year plus health system, what can we do as a medical school to partner with you in, mm -hmm. in being, you know, active in this area? And she didn't hesitate to tell me, we need you, you're educators. Mm -hmm. We need you to figure out how to educate our mm -hmm. provider workforce mm -hmm. in yeah. the kinds of things you talked about in your talk. So um, I guess my question for you is, any 
con considering the fact that, and we'll find out at our retreat that there are in fact faculty within our school who are yeah. doing things um, in little isolated pockets here and there. But, you know, do you have any thoughts about as a school, you know, what, what we can do to build our capacity to do those kinds of educational work that common spirit finds would be beneficial to them and how we would go about doing that. Yeah, these this is it's a really really great question and I think there's a lot of different ways to go about it. Um you know, one thought is thinking about students, thinking about trainees. Um and and their role with health systems. Um so one of the things that we've done at Columbia is we have um it's an elective, it's an interprofessional elective. But as part of it, we've partnered with our sustainability department and our students work with the sustainability department to come up with um, initiatives that that they've identified as being high yield. So for example, better segregation of red bag waste, um, not throwing away linens. Apparently, you know, the hospital Columbia loses like $3 million a year because people just like, oh, there's a little something out there in the garden. Like, anyway, you know, so the students learn about this and then they get out in the hospital and they're doing the education like they're standing around at nurses rounds and they're they're giving their little spiel and it's good experience for the students because they're able to sort of make a small impact understand what institutional advocacy or leadership looks like and so they're actually kind of coming into this space as as new leaders uh, and they're learning about what decarbonization is um, another initiative we have going on is we actually have a, a GME distinction um, that's open to all residents and fellows at Columbia. We're piloting it this year where, you know, we're going to accept basically a cohort of 15 and they're going to be doing sustainability and decarbonization efforts in the hospitals, but also doing research on them, right? So understanding life cycle assessments, understanding how do we make these decisions? Should we use disposable or reusable or where, you know, they're going to be understanding the science of it. So I think there's there's a way to do it with science and collaboration and research, bringing students in. And then there's also the top-down approach, right? Um, so for example, NHS um, in the UK, like they have a socialized health system, but you can sort of say, okay, well, common spirit is a microcosm of that. There are top-down things, like there's competencies for all health professionals that can be developed around these issues. Um, I'm happy to share more of that um, if you're interested, Tom, but you know, we all have to do these mandatory training modules um, every year. Sometimes you can just skip some multiple choice questions, but the idea is that, you know, we are doing <laughs> this education, right? And so there's ways, there's ways to do that. And then there's ways to incentivize it, um, you know, within the hospital setting. So there's also really interesting things that hospitals have done in terms of like taking what's called the cool food pledge. I don't know, that was a great a question before. The cool food pledge are hospitals who have agreed to provide food that is sustainable in their hospitals and health systems. And that's also good for the patients, right? So no more burgers and fries, but you know, there's actually going to be some some plant-based options on the menu and some things that are locally grown. Um, so yeah, I think that the sky's the limit. And I think there's a lot of different ways that that you could part. So in your prescriptions, uh, I caught many of them that were focused on what clinicians can do mm -hmm. uh, to adapt and be ready for yeah. um, the consequences of. And I heard about the sort of going far upstream with decarbonization or being carbon neutral. But I didn't hear a lot about sort of what a more um, community level upstream opportunity could be. Um, you mentioned that there are predictable populations that are disproportionately affected. Yeah. What's the role of the health system or clinicians in sort of that middle layer of going upstream to try to prevent yeah. some of the downstream health implications or is there a role for the health system or the clinician in that at that community level? Yeah, no, I, I think there there absolutely is. And I think in 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 many different ways. One, in identifying those vulnerable populations. Um, so there's a great group in um, in Colombia, there's probably a similar community group here that does environmental justice work, looking at where the vulnerable areas of, for example, Phoenix are, right? Those areas that are going to be exposed to really bad air quality and really bad heat, and then going out into those communities and doing an assessment of understanding, you know, what are the variables that are making these communities more, more vulnerable? And it was, it was so interesting as what came out of this study in, in Northern Manhattan was they asked, you know, community members who we identified were at really high risk of heat, what would help? And they said things like, well, public water fountains. Oh my gosh, they don't public water fountains. Like keeping the pool open a few hours later in the summertime when it's really hot out, right? Like the public pools, right? But the things they came up with were like 
pretty inexpensive, like very reasonable, very practical, but nobody had even thought about them or done them. And so I think there is definitely a role of, you know, bringing the academic institution, as it were, where we have community involvement already and using a climate lens to understand how, how climate is a variable in this community. And then I think physicians or clinicians or nurse practitioners, nurses, everybody, you know, as patients are coming in, um, we're providing education in the moment, right? And I, I think people ask, you know, should you be talking to every patient about climate change? Well, well, no, right? There's no way you can ask a provider to do that. But if it makes sense, if you're going into a heat season and you're seeing a patient to renew their, their diuretic, you should probably warn them about what heat stress looks like, right? So there's these teachable moments, I think, where we can sort of identify at-risk patients um, and do the education sort of in, in vivo in a lot of ways. Uh, first off, thank you so much for coming and talking to us. So I was just curious in the global conversations about climate change, how much is health something that's being talked about globally and the health impacts of climate change? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I was I was, uh, I've been going the past few years to the big UN climate conference every year. This year it was in Dubai of all places, right? In the, in the UAE. And it was the first year that there was a health day, the first year. Right. Um, and so that was, that was like a, a great moment for all of us in the health community who've been talking about this for a while, but it's not happening on the level that you would think it would be. Um, honestly, the world health organization showed up to the climate conversations about three years ago. Um, in terms of saying the WHO has a role here, we need to be, you know, readying health systems globally for this. So I would say in international climate conversations, health is not a big thing. And then, so then you can look at, well, about international health conversations, right? <laughs> is climate a big thing? Well, we have, you know, we have like WHO has an office of climate and health, right? So they're doing some stuff. Um, but the reality is, is I think that with the health and the climate stuff is we have to be thinking about it, not just as a siloed health issue, not just as a siloed climate issue, but it, it, it relates to everything, right? So I put a slide up that was talking about the World Bank Group, like what the heck does the World Bank Group care about climate change? Well, they do because they want to know that their investments in 30 years are still going to be good. But I was giving a talk to the Inter-American Development Bank last week. And their economists want to understand how do we build hospitals and health systems that are going to not collapse in disasters, but that are going to be sustainable and that are going to be profitable, right, into a world, into, into the future, right? So I guess the point is, is that I think it's popping up in smaller conversations everywhere, um, but it's not nearly at the level that I think we need it to be. Um, at, the, at the most recent um, UN conference, about 70 countries signed on to this health declaration. Um, it doesn't take a lot to sign on, you just sign on, um, <laughs> unfortunately. But basically, you know, calling this, this a crisis and, and pledging in theory to dedicate resources in their country to be able to start tackling these issues as they're facing um, the country. And there's an international initiative around this called the ATTACH initiative, which has four different work streams looking at various aspects of climate and health impacts and hopefully with national funding behind it. So I think there's movement. I think it's slow, um, but I think it's coming. Yeah. Any others? Well, we wanna say thank you again, Dr. Sorensen. We really appreciate you coming.